Well, thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you for inviting me to talk to a bunch of folks today uh, about something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is, which is native plants and, and native plant gardening. Um, I'm sure you've all been in the position where, you have, where you're about to make a fairly major decision and you have a bunch of possibilities in mind and one of them just stands out. It really resonates and you know it's the right thing to do. Well, that happened to me when I was getting ready for retirement. I had to figure out what to do with my time and energy once I retired. And taking care of the environment was the idea that, that bubbled up and, and really made a difference in, in how I was thinking about retire, well, my, my retirement. I grew up outdoors. I did a lot of camping and hiking. As you heard, I've, I've gardened for many years here on the, as much as you can when you're working a full-time job, right? Um, but um, so taking care of the environment on a much, on a, on a variety of ways really became my focus. You heard I, I joined the Conservation Foundation um, and I got the opportunity to design and implement the mini meadow uh, on, on Main Street. And I um, am continuing to work with them on uh, a variety of restorations, including the Mill Pond Overlook Trail, which runs right next door to here. So the shout out, if you haven't been down there, it's a wonderful little trail. Um, but really what I did was started with my own garden, my own landscape. Um, we are fortunate enough to have two acres of land here in Chatham, right down the street. Um, uh, the, the front half is just an ordinary house lot. Um, the back half, was it was all farmland and the back half was left kind of untended from the late 1960s until we started working on it. And it was, there were some nice native trees back there, but there was also more than an acre of porcelain berry and bittersweet and all the good stuff that comes with that. <laughs> so I think I see a lot of heads nodding <laughs> that you know what that's about. Um, and, the, um, and so I, I began gradually going to classes and learning what to do and hiring a, a contractor here and there to remove invasives and started planting. And um, I've learned um, a lot um, over, over these years. And, and out of that learning come the five projects I wanna offer you today. I've learned that you can start small and you can build up and make your property more eco-friendly over time. And that's kind of what I wanna to encourage today is that you, you just do something. And, it'll, and I'm giving you five options, six actually, um, because we have a bonus. Um, but, um, at, and as we go through, we'll, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about why these are important. Um, one of the key points that I learned that every little bit counts. Um, every small, if you add two native plants that attract pollinators to your yard, that is a good thing. Um, and this has been great, greatly reinforced by the research of one of the best entomologists in the country and one of the best native plant thinkers in the country, Doug Tallamy, who, who said, who believes that if you if a million households in America added some native plants to their yard, we would have the equivalent of an entire national park, you know, worth of native habitat. Um, he calls it home, uh, homegrown, um, the, the homegrown national park. So this is one of the things that became really important for me to do was to create this kind of habitat on my own property. Um, and it all starts with native plants. The native plants themselves are kind of fundamental. Um, it, one, of the, one of the lessons, it, it, this, was, this, this took me an embarrassingly long time to kind of get into my head as a, I had been a traditional ornamental gardener for 30 years, right? So I had to unlearn a lot of stuff. Um, and one of them was that, um, Gardens are not just a, a beautiful visual display like 3D artwork. They really are a living ecosystem. And a beautiful garden over time became to me over time, not just something that's aesthetically beautiful, but it's full of life. And, it's, and that life is the intersection of the native plants and the insect population and the, and the bird populations that rely on those native plants. They evolve together over time. Um, they have mutual benefits. The insects and birds pollinate the, the plants so that they can reproduce and, and expand. Um, they, the plants then provide um, food and habitat and overwintering capabilities 
for the native plants and they, they're an ecosystem. They are all mutually dependent, mutually beneficial relationships here. And it's the native plants that are the foundation for that. And so if you're going to, if you want to have that kind of eco-friendliness in your own yard, you need to have some native plants. Now, some ornamental plants are health are good for, for you know, insects, et cetera, but the, the best plants for that are the native plants. And there are, I wanna, I need to spend a minute or two on a definition here, which is that the native plants are, are those plants that evolved with the insects and the other kind, the other wildlife population. And, and then became and have now um, and live here naturally. They grow here naturally in the wild and we have adopted them to take into our gardens. Um, the most beneficial are what we call straight species. These are the ones that actually grow in the wild. Um, they're now um, often um, cultivated by the nursery trade and you can buy them in the nursery, which is a good thing. Um, but they're still uh, native to Cape Cod. They're still the same species, the same genetics, and the same ecological value as the plants growing in the wild. Um, and you can tell what those, those plants are when you look at the Latin name. Here I have a nice example of the beach plum. And, and in parentheses, and you'll see this threat, uh, threat here. I'll put the Latin name uh, in parentheses after it. Um, if it's just two Latin words, it's a straight species. Now you have to kind of know which of the European straight species versus the, the uh, American Cape Cod natives, but you'll learn that over time. But if it's just two, that, that's a good start. There are lots of other native plants being sold in the nursery trade. Most of them are cultivars or hybrids um, where the, the breeders have taken them and uh, bred them to highlight certain features of it. They might make the flower showier uh, they might make colored leaves, you know, they might make a different size. Um, and, you know, these are more problematic for, um, for your gardens. They may be just as eco-friendly as the straight species, but they might not be either. And the, the trade doesn't know and they can't tell you, which is the, which is the real problem. On the, on the right here, you see, this is also in my yard. It's a, um, it's a nine bark shrub, which is lovely native shrub, almost everything you buy in the nursery trade has been, is a cultivar or a hybrid. They have beautiful purple leaves and some nice bright gold leaves and this sort of thing. But um, I have never seen an insect on my plant. <laughs> so it's kind of telling you that, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful plant and I'm not gonna take it out, but it's not adding the ecological value that I really want here. Um, similarly, um, there are native plants, American native plants, that are not native to Cape Cod. There are no hydrangeas native to Cape Cod, unfortunately. <laughs> but there are hydrangeas native to the southeast, and they actually do pretty well up here. And they, they're great for pollinators. I have a, what's called a smooth hydrangea, um, which is the white lace cap hydrangea. And, they're, and I have oak leaf hydrangeas. Insects are all over those all summer long. So they're good. You, and these, these differences, you almost have to learn kind of by experience. Um, I will tell you in the plant list that I, the handout you have, there is a plant list and um, most of them, um, well, I'm gonna say 90% of them in my experience in my yard um, are, have, uh, are valuable to the pollinators. So that, that might be a good place for you to start. Um, all right. The, um, so here are the five projects I want to kind of offer you to, to uh, consider for, for working on this spring. And the first one is if you, uh, if you only do one thing, plant a native tree. Surprisingly, these are uh, just about the, will serve the most number of insects and pollinators and other kinds of wildlife as anything else you could put in your garden. Um, they provide a great deal of ecological ben benefits. They, they're wonderful at trapping runoff and controlling water flow in your yard. Um, they, have, they sequester carbon, they produce oxygen, you know, all the things any good tree does. But which tree should you plant? <coughs> um, there's actually been some research on this. And they, um, this is the, the same Doug Tallamy. He, he has a whole um, 
cadre of graduate students. And he sends them out to do research on how many insects, how many different species of insects use which kind, which tree, which kind of tree. Um, and his barometer is caterpillars. He's chosen that because caterpillars um, seem to be kind of the sweet spot in, among the insect world um, of where the, most of the ecological value starts. And you can read his book to learn why. I'm, I'm, I'm not that good at it. Um, but he found that the oak trees in particular um, are far and away the best for supporting insects and in, in, in wildlife population. They support like, I don't know, three times as many species as any other, as any other um, tree type. So if you have the room, uh, plant an oak tree. Um, red maples, um, black cherries, birches, pines are all great and they're all native and we know those plants and we, you probably have them in your yard already, which is, which is a good thing. But if you need a smaller tree, there's, there's a good number of um, smaller tree, native trees that you might consider. The service berry, it's also called a shad bush. It's, also, it's often sold as a multi-stemmed kind of large shrub instead of a, a single trunk tree. Um, the pagoda dogwood uh, or the alternate leaf dogwood is, um, is looks just almost like a, um, the regular dogwoods um, and it's, it's native. Um, the hop hornbeam is, it's also called ironwood because the wood is as hard as anything, you know, it, it's just as, as the name says. Um, the red cedars, which we, we all know, and the American holly. These are all nice small trees that provide good ecological value and you know, would be lovely in your yard. And in the handout, I, I've shared some tips on buying native trees and on how to plant them. So you get, you get a little bit of guidance there. All right, here's the second, here's the second project, um, which is replacing your bark mulch with a living mulch. Um, you've, you've seen it all over town. You may even have it in your, in your own yard where you have lot, you know, a tree or a bunch of shrubs along with your foundation planting and all you have underneath it is bark mulch. And you still spend a lot of time weeding, right? So if you replace that bark mulch with a living mulch, plants, native plants that attract pollinators, um, you will be doing wonderful things. You will be saving yourself time because this, that layer of native plants will prevent weeds from germinating and will prevent seeds from falling into your, into your ground. Um, and it will help the pollinators and give ecological value. And it's pretty, you know, you can, you can make it look really pretty underneath, you know, underneath your ray of, of hydrangeas, you know, put a, put a layer, of layer, layer of plants right underneath it. So here's that same one on the left hand side. This is, this is over on Stage Harbor Road. Um, and it, it just looks so forlorn. <laughs> I, I decided I needed to do a practice design project. So I took, I took this picture and then I went and, and got clippings of little plants and put it around the base just to see how, what a difference it could make just, it, visually as well as ecologically. So um, underneath here, there's some lady fern, there's white wood, this is shade. This is a little shade garden. Lady fern, a white wood aster, green and gold, Solomon seal, phlox, prairie drop seed grasses. So you could put this around the base of any tree. Oops, sorry. Um, on the right hand side is, these are two shrubs in my yard. There's that same nine bark on the left with all the purple leaves. Right next to it is a native shrub called a father giller, which has beautiful white blossoms in the springtime. But underneath, you know, whoops, look at this bottom layer. We have, this is Christmas fern right in here. And the white flowers here and here or white wood aster. And then we've got some Virginia creeper. This just showed up and I decided to leave it as, as part of the ground cover. I don't let it climb in the trees I and mean, I cut it down when it climbs the trees, but I let it go all over the ground because it's a really nice ground cover. So with um, this, and there's lots of options for things that you can use as low plants and ground cover, both sun and shade. You know, and so here's, here's some examples of them. Um, the two on the left are in, are in my yard, more Christmas fern. Um, this bottom here is these, whoops, these larger leaf ones, it's called Allegheny Spurge. It's the native version of Pachysander. So the same, but it's, uh, it's bigger than the 
Japanese pachysandra that we are familiar with. And there's some wild ginger back here. Again, uh, the native version of that shiny little ginger <coughs> plant that people grow. Um, this was not shiny and it doesn't spread as quickly. And then wild strawberry down here, this spreads quickly. So um, it's, it's a great ground cover if you um, to get a lot of bare soil covered quick, um, fairly fast. These two pictures are on the Rose Kennedy Greenway in Boston, and they've done just a wonderful job with underplanting. Um, this this is this is mayapple, which is a native woodland plant here that grows here on the Cape, um, and this is uh, foam flower and coral bells. And they planted a lot of these, and they've grown and in, all intertwined, and kind of made a nice little tapestry effect. So you can be really artistic, you know, when you're kind of figuring out what to, what to plant as your ground cover. All right, here's project number three. This is probably the most ambitious of the five. Um, and what the project is to take a section of the lawn, and we all know lawn is bad, right? <laughs> um, it's not all bad, but um, it's, um, to, you take a section of your lawn, get rid of the grass and plants, plant shrubs and trees and, and perennials in that um, as an, uh, kind of an island bed. Um, and this has a lot of benefits. Um, it, it can be aesthetically pretty, depending on, on what you do and how you do it. Um, but it can have um, a wonderful kind of side effect, come on in, um, of helping control water runoff. Particularly, if, like if your house is up here and the road is down here, you're going to have a lot of runoff into the street or the other way around. They're going to have a lot of road runoff into your house. And that's what these two examples have done. This is, um, this is on the loop here, the Cedar Street loop. They, you see the house is up here and slopes down to the street and they've take, carved out a long skinny bed right in the front here um, to catch the, any water runoff before it hits the street. This is almost serving like a rain garden. Um, and then they've done on the same with your driveway, they've taken the, and they've run a little channel goes right into the, into the shrub layer. And these are winterberries and arrowwood viburnums, all native plants, just one row of each. You know, kind of, and it's really lovely. Um, and it's really serving a ecological value um, and um, conservation value in controlling the runoff. This one's the other way around. You know, their house is below and they built their garden, their island here um, above the house, you know, to, to keep the water from, you know, rolling downhill to their house. These aren't all native plants, but you kind of get the idea. They've made it a little more formal because there's a little stone edge all the way around, which you could, which is, you, know, you, you could, that's your choice about how you want to make it. This one, they took the whole corner and this side is very neat and tidy and manicured. This side is all native plants and it's, and it's they've let it be messy. So they, they've been able to get a little of both the, the artistic value. Um, now here's the formula. It's actually fairly straightforward. Um, but you do, you take trees and shrub layers and then fill the ground layer with a living mulch. So here's the schematic. Two, three smaller trees and a whole bunch of shrubs. And then you, then you fill in the ground. And this is one of my favorite looking examples of it. Um, and they have, it's, there they using river birch and father gillow and Virginia sweet spire are the two shrubs and then a whole bunch of stuff underneath. I don't even know all the things that they put underneath. Um, the, this is, this is uh, Virginia, this is a sweep of Virginia uh, bluebells that come up in the um, early spring. Uh, and this is, this happens to be uh, carved out on the walkway between the driveway down here and the house over here. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting technique. It's very flexible. Uh, I'm in the process of creating two of these on my own property, um, and I'm using them to help um, direct traffic, you know, direct the pathways as you wander around through the gardens. These are kind of strategically positioned, but I'm doing the same thing, shrubs with a ground layer. Um, here's some more native shrubs that you can use as your, you know, for your island beds. Um, Sweet pepper bush is one of the, I think, 
it's it's getting to it's it's one of my favorite plants, but it's getting to be more and more popular in the in the nursery trade. So they're getting to be relatively easy to get. Um, they come in the straight species is a big thing. It's could be this high and this big around. Um, but they also sell cultivars that are like knee high, and they're they're and I have a couple of those too, and they're also pollinator friendly. So I I would vouch for the for those. Um, the version of the straight species I have is. Um, it's actually called, it's called Ruby Spice and it has pink flowers. And that's also a, still um, excellent for pollinators. Um, sweet fern you might have seen uh, at the Mayo House. We have a whole bunch of it right in the front. And it's, it's a small, it's a small shrub, kind of rounded, it's, it's very pretty. Inkberry, you know, winterberry, I'm sure you know. Oak leaf hydrangeas, I'm sure you know. These are, these are great. I got an email from somebody that says, I want to replace a whole row of burning bush. What do I put in place? Or I have a, a, a whole, I've got a sort of a small hedge of um, butterfly bush. I want to take it out. <laughs> so I, these are great to replace big shrubs, you know, that you want to, that you want to replace them with a native. Uh, I always thought the red twig dogwoods were kind of Asian, but they're not, they're native, which is kind of cool. Um, and the high bush blueberry is surprisingly interesting as an ornamental plant. It's, uh, it's got this great fall color um, and it's uh, got a nice, that nice v base shape. So it would be great in one of these island beds. All right, so here's num project number four. Um, if you have a garden bed already, I would probably wager you have holes in it. Um, you've placed the plants far apart and they didn't spread or something died and it, or is not doing well and you want to take it out. Well, here's the, the project is just leave your existing beds, everything the way it is, and just fill in the holes with native perennials. And you'll be able to get um, some nice pollinator action in your garden beds just by filling in the holes. Sure, if you want to take out the non-native plants, go for it, but you don't have to. This was this is in my yard. Um, I've got a, that's a 40 foot bed a six or eight feet deep right behind the house. And I've, this, I've been gardening this particular bed for 20 years in that configuration. And I've got some nice shrubs there, non-native shrubs that I don't wanna get rid of. You know, the, the little um, spruce and the caryoptis and the spirea in the background. And, um, but you can see I've got, I've got a few native plants. This is sundrops, which is, which is native. Um, this red is a bee balm, a scarlet bee balm. Um, but you can see the holes, you know, um, I, um, in here. And so what I've been doing is filling in those holes with sneezeweed, helenium, which is a nice orangey plant, um, the gallardia, which is this, this here, blanket flower, um, anise hyssop, which is nice purple spikes to it in the midsummer. Uh, Penstemon, which is, you know, no, it's not there yet. A big white billowy kind of uh, flower is in June. Um, Joe Pye, which I probably all know, and goldenrod. Now there are goldenrods that will not take over your garden. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're the ones I'm using. Um, there's probably six or eight different species that are, you can get if you look for, that are not the, um, the Canada goldenrod, which will, take, which will take over your garden. I have that too, and I, I consider that a weed in this garden bed. I let it go other places up in the wilder parts, but it's a weed in here. Um, so that, that's kind of one of my ongoing projects. Every year I look for a new hole. Um, I've been told by the ecologists that um, your target it, um, should be, uh, I, I hate the word should, but a good target to think about is 70% of your plant mass should be native. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm not there yet on this one. I'm probably at 55 or 60%. So I'm going to add some more. I'm just going to keep adding more as I get more holes. <laughs> yeah, so. Here's another example of a mixed bed where, where um, the gardener put in um, a bunch of natives. So we have um, the false indigo up here, the baptisia, the sweet fern, that shrub here. This is Slender Mountain Mint, which is a wonderful flower with nice um, white blooms in the late summer. And down at the bottom, we have Barren Strawberry, which is used as the 
the living mulch. So and you obviously you see all the non-natives in there too. So, um, or put some native plants in a pot. Um, I do this all the time. To, if I want to grow the plants that the rabbits eat, and they eat a lot, like this uh, coneflower. I can't grow echinacea because the rabbits eat it. I can't grow blazing star because the rabbits eat it. You know, the, I can't grow asters because the rabbits eat them. So um, what I'll do is I'll take them and put them in a pot and I'll put a low cage kind of right around the base the edge of the pot and they're pretty safe. It's gotta be a pretty tall rabbit to kind of <laughs> get, in, get, in, get at those. Um, here's a, a native shrub called yellow root. Um, it's not a particularly interesting shrub, but I, I decided to buy it and put it in and the rabbits ate it. So it's now in a pot and it's, it's doing fine. It's a little piece of green right outside a door. Um, here's, here's a native shrub on the Rose Kennedy Greenway again. And they underplant it with bulbs. Um, they will take those bulbs out in May and late May and plant, put annuals in there. Makes a really nice kind of pot design. Um, and here's another one I was trying to, this is royal fern and um, red columbine, the, the wild columbine kind of mixed together. It's, I like the texture of the leaves together. Um, this particular combination hasn't survived. Um, the, tree, the shade tree that they were under uh, fell over. So it's the sun kind of did its thing and the, the fern didn't like it. So. Um, but the, col the columbine's still there. That, that will self-seed into any open ground that you have. So it's, it's a wonderful little, little thing. So there's lots of places to put native perennials without having to tear things up and start all over again. And here's a, here's a few others. There's some more listed in, in, in your plant list. Um, you may have heard, see, this is the, this is what I was talking, this is the Penstemon beard tongue. And that's this, it'll make whole, um, clusters of these beautiful white flowers. Um, see, the seaside goldenrod that you, we actually grows on the beach here. Um, you can buy as a native plant and the, these are tough as nails. We have them, uh, we just put some in in front of the Mayo house right at the edge where people walk. They did fine. Yeah, they got like very little water this year and they, they did just fine. Um, This is one that not too many people know about. It's a relative of the red cardinal flower, you know, the lobelia cardinal flower, but it's called the great blue lobelia. And it does, it's not as fussy about water and it doesn't need as much water as the red um, um, cardinal flower does. Um, and it, um, it's a little bit more reliable. And it has these spectacular blue purple flowers. And so if you, if you find those, they're a great addition to any um, you know, per any, any flower bed that you have. And so far the rabbits haven't gotten them. So that's, all right, here's project number five. I'm gonna ask you to be a kid again and make a mess. <laughs> um, and, and this has some real um, ecological logic behind it. Um, what we're trying to do when we're creating these ecosystems in our yard is to give the, the, the pollinators and the insects not just food, but habitat and a place to uh, lay their eggs and, uh, and breed and then overwinter. And the way where they like to do this is in places that we consider a mess. They consider is just fine. So um, in the summertime, the life cycle of the caterpillar to the butterfly is that the caterpillars you know, hang around in your oak trees, eat the leaves. Um, and then when they get ready to become pupae, they drop into the leaf litter at the base of the oak tree. So if you have just like bark mulch at the end base of the oak tree, that pupil won't survive. Your butterflies will die at that stage of their life cycle. So if you want butterflies, you know, you need to have a mess, uh, you know, just the leaf litter. Don't rake under there, leave the leaf litter under your oak trees. That's, this is, you know, kind of in the back of our yard. And that's what I've done. The leaves just blow there naturally. The wind puts them there. I just don't take them out. Um, and it, and that, that's how you keep that life cycle going. Same in the winter time. Um, insects will overwinter in a whole variety of different places. There's like over a hundred species of 
native bees, wasps, and flies. And they all have different kind of habits about where they like to live. But most, a lot of it's in the leaf litter. Um, a lot of it's in the hollow stems of your perennials. Um, not your ornamental perennials, the non-natives, but in the native ones. So, um, so what you do here is um, the action you take is in the fall, um, just don't do any cleanup, just leave it. Don't rake, don't cut the, your plants down, just leave it. And leave it there until you see insects flying around in the spring, usually mid-April or so. The, the soil has to kind of warm up a little bit. Um, and then you can cut things down, don't rake. Uh, well, let me, let me back up. Then you can cut the stems down um, and uh, rake except under your trees. <laughs> So um, I actually will, uh, in some of the wilder parts of my yard, I will leave everything there. I'll, I'll, I'll do what they call a chop and drop. You break the stems off, break them up and just leave them there. You don't take them away anywhere. They just stay in the garden bed. Um, and that becomes the compost for the next year. So that's it's kind of self-fertilizing that way. Um, and if you have space for it, another thing you might do is just take a corner and just let it be wild. Don't touch it. Put your brush pile there and just, and you know, don't take all your brush, you know, to the transfer center, leave it there, make a, make a nice pile and you'll be amazed at what lives in there. You know, um, and I don't go back into mine very often, but I will sometimes I'll see snakes slow through and I'll see all these little critters running around back there. Um, and I, I saw a box turtle in one day last year, which was a real treat. So, um, so one thing you might do is carve out a big island bed in one corner and have your wild place be behind it. You know, so you don't have to look at it. So there's lots of different ways you can do this to leave a mess. And then finally, this is the bonus project. And this is really a do nothing project. So, so it's, that's why I didn't really want to call it that. Um, I did this 15 years ago, so I wanted to share with you what happened to my yard when I when I went through this process. Um, I decided that it, it was kind of like a three year process. First, I just called the, the people who were coming to put on the fertilizer and stuff. I just said, cancel the contract. We're done. <laughs> we're not doing this anymore. Um, and then I started a three year phase out of the watering. I didn't want to do it all at once because I didn't want to kill everything. I wanted to encourage the roots of the grasses that were going to survive to go deeper. Um, and so I cut the watering in half, but meaning I watered half as often, but I still watered deeply. And that encourages the roots to grow a little bit, a little bit deeper. And then the second year cut it back again. And then the third year I just stopped altogether. And I haven't watered my lawn in you know, 12 years. Um, yeah, so it looks pretty brown in the summertime, as you can imagine. Um, what happens is the non-native grasses, the broadleaf grasses, will die off. And they absolutely will die off. And what you'll be left with is the fescues, the thin, the thin grasses. Uh, and we have bare spots, um, non-native things will come, I mean, non-grass things will come in, little wildflowers um, or clover or dandelions will come in. Um, and, but you can, you can overseed it if you want with micro clover or other, other kinds of e eco-friendly lawn grasses, more fescue, uh, and it will, um, and it will um, still be green, but it won't be uniform. So here's, here's some pictures of what my lawn looks like last summer. Um, most of the lawn here is fescue, and in the places under the trees where it's shaded, it's gorgeous. It looks really like a nice, pretty lawn in the, sh in the shade. Uh, one shady moist area, one, one area that was too moist, um, it's, it's almost complete shade. Um, uh, I've got mo uh, moss growing there now. You know, the, the grass is gone and it's all moss, which I, I kind of like, you know, I think it's kind of cool. Um, I've got one area, this is over the septic system and the developer took away all the topsoil. Okay, so it's, it's pretty rough out there. Um, and it, it's, it looks it, it's quite patchy. I can't get in, I haven't, I had dandelions in there for a while, but they kind of died off after, after a while. And I'm, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do, but I, I don't mind a few patches here and there, but that's, what, that, that's a risk that you take. Um, but look at all the neat stuff that's growing. I've got one whole field of, 
um, buttercups that are just gorgeous. And I have to kind of tell my lawn mower is wait, 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 <laughs> wait till buttercups are gone before you mow that section. Um, this is all white clover that's, that came in. And this is a native plant called Selfield, which is little tiny purple blossoms. There's more native, more native things that come in as well. So it's kind of fun to see what to see what comes in. My husband still bemoans the beautiful manicured lawn. <laughs> he said, we used to have a nice lawn once, but I said, we have a nice lawn now. <laughs> so we just disagree on that. <laughs> um, all right, so I want to. I want to end with some practical aspects of this. And that's like one of the things people ask me is where do you buy these? Where do you get these native plants? Um, the, the nurseries around here, most of them carry some native plants. Uh, they're not, a lot of them are cultivars, um, but you, they will have some straight species um, of things. Um, Capabilities has a program where they actually grow their own native plants from seed. Um, so they, they're right next door to the um, APCC and the APC has taught them how to do that. You know, so so it, you know you're getting good native plants when you, from, from there. Um, I've gotten country garden and hyannis um, and, and a few from everywhere else on there as well. Uh, Crocker and Cape Coastal and Dennis are really good at shrubs. They have really good selection of native shrubs, shrubs and trees. Um, they're, they're, plant, they're perennials that have been increasing more. They have been, they have been increasing as well. Both of them have been increasing the number of native perennials. So um, I wanna point out this one though, blue stem natives. And I have a correction, that's not no wood, that's no well. So um, that, that's a new, a new native plant nursery. Um, it's run by, it's women owned and run they grow all their own plants from seed, native plants from seed, which is a rarity you know, in this area. Um, and they've grown a lot, they're, they're getting bigger and bigger. Um, they, uh, they're right, on, uh, right off Route 3. You know, if you know, the, if you remember the old exits, they're right off the old exit 14, um, just a, between Hanover and Hingham, you know, right up, right up in that area. So I would, um, they, uh, and one of the things I like is they grow their, they sell their plants in one quart containers. So they're bigger than plugs, but, but they're not as big as the, well, the big gallon things that you get at Crocker or Agway and some of those. So they're cheaper. They're like 11 bucks instead of 17, you know, so, uh, which is, which, which I like a lot. And they almost always have things that I'm not looking for, but I think, oh, this would be fun. <laughs> so when I, when I go in there, um, they have a good website, so you can see what they are. They tell you a lot about the native plants. You can't, you can order them. You, they'll tell you what they have in stock. You can place an order and you have to go pick it up within the next three or four days. Um, so that's, that's a good one. If the best selection though is up at um, Native Plant Trust, the Garden in the Woods in Framingham. Um, they have everything. And for a number of years, I, I would, uh, Take the truck you know, place a pre-order because you can pre-order there too and they'll tell you when the plants are ready and you can just i take the truck and fill the truck with, with native plants that's how i got the 125 species that are in my garden now um but the other this is a new one for me and i've tried it and it's worked really well um which is prairie moon nursery and they sell plugs they're little tiny baby plants they're about uh, you, know, you know five inches deep and about an inch and a half across and they're cheap, they're like four or five bucks each, um, but they're small and they need a little bit more care. You know, you gotta water them more consistently and that kind of stuff. But that's what I bought to populate my meadow that I planted last year. And by July, some of those plants were three feet tall. They grew up really well. So you might, if you want to do a lot of plants, you might consider using plugs and going through Prairie Moon Nursery. Um, when you shop for plants, please try to use the botanical names. The common names are misleading. So I always have a list of the ones I want with common names and botanical names. And I go to see what they have. They almost, I've never been in a shop where they have everything I want, right? <laughs> so 
So I will make the rounds of you know, two or three different places. Um, and I'll do that. And then I'll decide I'm not going to be able to find that this year. What am I going to do instead? Then I'll think about substitutions after that. So I'll make another round and, and kind of get the, get the rest of, of what I need for, for that particular garden bed for that particular season. Um, um, I say shop early, but particular, particularly um, blue stem natives, they put the plants out when they're ready. You know, they won't, they won't put out a tiny little plant that won't survive in your yard. So the plants that bloom in the late summer, you know, they won't put out until June. You know, so the plants that bloom in June, they'll put out in May. You know, so you have to, the timing, you have to keep an eye on when the plants are available. They may or may not be ready when you want, the weekend you want to do your big planting. <laughs> okay. And then finally, I wanted to give you, um, and this is all in your handout, a whole bunch of um, resources if you want to go learn more. If you do any one of these, I would suggest that book, Northeast Native Plant Primer by Uli Lorimer. Uli is the Director of Horticulture at Garden in the Woods and Native Plant Trust. He's fabulous. And he wrote a book, it was out about a year and a half ago, something like that. Um, and 235 native plants, he, one page per plant, and great illustrations, great pictures. He writes about where they occur in the wild and what conditions and how to grow them and a lot about the plant itself. So if, if you're gonna buy one book, that would be the one I, I would go to. Most, many of these websites will have um, like APCC, I'm sorry, APCC did this website called the Cape Cod Native Plant Finder. And you can put in what kind of situation you have, sun, water, you know, sun shade, water, amount of water, whether you want trees or shrubs, and it will give you a list of good plants for, the, for your situation. So that's really helpful too. I use that a lot. I use that and the Native Plant Trust Garden Finder also will give you same, same kind of thing. You tell it what your situation is that you're looking for, and it will come back and give you the list of plants that will work in that situation. And you can specify there Cape Cod natives. So, and APC is only plants that will work on Cape Cod. So, so those are good. You can do, go down rabbit holes on all of these websites. So <laughs> um, I will point out if you haven't seen it already, I, I do write a blog on native plant gardening on Cape Cod. It's, um, I started this a few years ago when I was kind of, all of my lessons learned were, I was trying to kind of crystallize them in my own head. And I say, well, what better way to do that than write it down? So that's, that's kind of my benefit. I, I get to write down what I'm learning and what I'm, what I'm trying and what works and what doesn't. And I'm sharing it, you know, with anybody that wants to read it. So um, we'd love to, if you want to stop by, um, that's, that's the website address. Um, and then finally, I want to end with um, a plug. I'm doing another presentation. It's this Saturday, sponsored by the Chatham Conservation Foundation. Um, they part of their winter webinar series. Uh, and it's not this presentation. It's the presentation I'm talking about my favorite plants, the ones that have done the best in my garden. So it's all about the plants, not about the projects. You can figure out where to put them. I'm talking about the plants. So. Um, you can, um, and I, I'm going to give you a little trick. Go, go to Conservation Foundation organization, go to their events, uh, find this one. It will tell you it's closed, it's full up, but put your name on the waiting list because we have a secret workaround and we will send you the link. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, it turns out uh, the um, registration site uh, is only free up to a certain number. But Zoom can handle as many as you want, right? So this, we'll just send you the Zoom link. You know, um, you know if you if you're if you're on the waiting list, you know, on the registration site. So um, I hope this has been helpful, interesting, whatever. Um, be happy to take questions. If anybody has questions, comments, wants to share their own garden experience. You mentioned your rabbits. You can see about everything you plant. Rabbits have got a, a fences around their own yard looks like little, little fences, fences, right? Well, I have, um, yes, they do. I, I think rabbits have this kind of ESP, or maybe they can smell fresh dirt. I don't know what it is, but everything I plant, they, they try. 
yeah. right? So, um, and the even shrubs, you know, they will eat all the little branches off the shrubs. I can't grow blueberries because they'll, they're too low and the rabbits will eat all the little stems off the blueberry plants. Um, so for bigger shrubs, I do have those little fences and I'll, and I'll keep them there until the stems, the lowest leaves are high enough that they're not, rabbits aren't interested in them. So maybe one or two years. For perennials, I'll take that rabbit spray and, and the anti-rabbit spray and spray them for like a month. And, and they might try it, but by then it's not new anymore. The plant is a little bit bigger and they, they tend to ignore it. I've all, yeah, I've also, another thing I've, I do is there are plants that rabbits just do not like. Um, and one of them is wild strawberry. Dwarf hummingbird mint. I'm sorry? Dwarf hummingbird. Dwarf hummingbird mint. <laughs> and so put a lot of that around the plants you want to save. I've, I have, I can grow white wood asters if I have a ground layer of wild strawberry, they will not cross that wild strawberry to get to a, a, a plant you want. So it's a great ground cover. To, it's a rabbit preventative as well. But it's um, but there are things I just have given up on, <laughs> you know, I, because the rabbits are just a little bit too voracious. I don't have that big a problem with deer. You know, the deer do come through the yard, but they don't see they eat, they eat down like chokeberry. You know, so but that's the only thing they've. The deer have destroyed, but the rabbits are everywhere. They so. don't seem to like the mint. They, the they, mint they don't. In, yeah, the mint family is good. Anything yeah. in the mint family, like that Slender Mountain Mint that was in here, and there's a Broadleaf Mountain Mint that's, yeah. that, yeah, that, that they don't like. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> they're cute, but they're <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you cope with the fact when you mix a bed with native versus non-native, the, the native aren't going to need as much water as the non-native. And so I've wondered how you don't change the whole thing over, you know, <laughs> because yeah, yeah, you're going to yeah. end up, maybe that's the thing you'll end up killing off the non-native. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I haven't run into that problem because I've always been a low maintenance kind of gardener and I never put in things that need a lot of care and pampering, you know, so like daylilies are wonderful because they don't need much. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so they're the ones that, and the, um, the non-natives in that garden that I showed you are like catnip and they're pretty tough plants. So I haven't run into that, that particular issue. You're right. You, you don't, you want to have things in the same bed that require the same amount of care and, and attention. So okay, same kind of soil, same kind of watering. Yeah, I, you, you probably can't. So if you have plants in your bed that need a lot of water, put in plants that grow in moist conditions in the wild. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you can find that out on any of the plant finder websites. Right. Yeah. yeah, put in rain garden plants. Yeah. Um. Uh, for about three years now, I kind of um, have a difficulty with garlic mustard. Oh, yes. And um, I know last year, some of it I just couldn't cope with. I got most of it out. And so those kind of weeds, is, it, is there a, a, a way to take care of them? Uh, other than yanking them out, which is what I've ended up doing for two years now. Um, garlic mustard in particular has a couple of variations on what you've been doing that you can you might want to try. Um, they're a biennial plant, right? So they only they they grow the little rosette grows the first year, and the second year the flower stalk comes up. Um, okay, so well, think... and then after that 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 particular plant dies, but the but the flowers will produce hundreds and hundreds of seeds that go everywhere and those plants then take root. Mm -hmm. So the key to garlic mustard is don't let them bloom. So when you see the, the stalks starting to come up, go out there with head strippers mm -hmm. and kind of just cut off the, the heads. You don't have to pull the plant. The plant's gonna die. You just cut off all the heads and, and then that will be a lot faster than getting on your knees and pulling them out one by one by one. And then that soil that's still there or the plants that are still there, um, 
will they not come up for next year? Well, those particular plants will not, but it will take two or three years for, to, to exhaust the seed bank because mm -hmm. from the, the seeds from two years ago are probably still in the soil and they'll come up. So, so just keep doing just it. Keep doing it. And yeah, eventually um, we'll get rid of all the seeds. The key is not to let it bloom. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, your, your yard there that you said was over by the leach field or whatever that's yeah. patchy, yucky. Uh, um, I don't think you said yucky, but- um, It I is. <laughs> I have that side yard. Um, is that a candidate for um, clover? And if so, how do you how do you plant clover? Because I have it's, I have Bunniesville out there on a side yard that is in sun all day long. You know the whole summer it gets hit with sun, but it's just a yeah. I mean yeah. you couldn't even try to call it a Cape Cod yard. It's far <laughs> too yucky from yeah. Well, um, you could try clover. Uh, they you can it, you can buy it in seed. You uh -huh. can just plant it like grass seed, and, okay. and take care of it like grass seed. I don't know how long it would last. Particularly if they're bunnies there, they might just chew it up on you. Uh, but but then as a ground cover, the, the clover would would just give the green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other there's another uh, that self heal that I put up there might also be a good candidate. That, that grows in crappy soil. What's the name of that again? Self heal. Okay. It's in your um, it's in your Not handout um, and it's called Prunello vulgaris. Okay. And you can buy that at uh, Native Plant Trust. You can buy that as a plug. So you, you might try a patch of 10 or 20 of them and see what happens, see if it, see if it, you will have, all of these plants, when you put them in, you have to water them just like any other plant for the first year. You know, a lot of people have this idea, you put it in a native plant, you never water it again. That's after it's established, okay? You do have to go through the at least one year where you establish the plant and you have to water it, you know, just like any other normal plant, so. Thank you. Yeah. What are we doing for time, are we? We're just about at six. What else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in all your travels, and you've obviously been to a lot of great nurseries, um, do you ever run into the pale pink, two tone pink Cleome and it, in any quantity in the fall version? And what time of year as, or how early? Yeah. I'm not familiar with that plant, oh. so that's uh, I I well, I've seen it as an annual, but I've not. Is, well, does it grow as a perennial as well? I I think I think in the summer in the south. It, does it? It, it grows to stay alive. Yeah, yeah. Up here it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that that's the interesting thing is that all of these native plants are regional, right? <laughs> so yeah, you know, I I have a family in North Carolina, I have family in Denver, and they keep saying, "What can I plant?" And I says, "I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, because you know, the, because I I would have to study up their region, you know, the what are the plants in their region that would um, that I could so I could help them. So anything else? Well, thank you so much. I hope you find something that ladies and gentlemen, Kathy West. <laughs>